Um, wow, you guys, I'm so nervous. I was just trying to talk about this a minute ago. I'm so like, oh, I get really, um, I, I think it's just like, I have so many things that I want to talk with you about. And I have so many ideas that I also like want to leave a lot of time for questions about, um, just cause I really appreciate this forum that Josh has created to talk about how, like all of the diverse approaches that exist to creating space and experiences and like anything that gather people in space and time. Um, I just feel like, yeah, it's, it's a really, it's a really lovely series and, and I'm, I'm very grateful to be here. So I think my nerves are all appreciation. Um, so just by way of introduction, thank you, Josh. Uh, my name is Annie Saunders. I make live experiences, largely site specific live experiences. So things that respond to the place that they are. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my work and show you guys some examples, but just as a sort of overview, some of them take the shape of things that look like theatrical productions or like um, immersive interactive theater. Um, I have a company called Wilderness based in LA that makes um, experiential events in buildings that are set for demolition or redevelopment. And those shows often look like interactive um, performance. Um, the work also often looks like installations that people walk through uh, with interactive light and sound that responds to what, what they're doing. And then I also make works for public space, um, the majority of which are headphone walks that are activated by GPS on time of day. Um, so basically like sitting between performance practice, um, new technologies, public art, um, and like happenings, which is why I kind of wanted to talk today um, about the work, but also about kind of the essential principles that I see that constitute something feeling live. Because um, I think something that like, it feels like we have in common in this forum is like an interest in creating things that, um, yeah, that gather gather people in space and time. Um, and so I wanna talk about those five elements. But firstly, I would like to also uh, share um, one like generative practice that I do in my work often in like responding to a place or a, um, uh, a, a space or a place, I will say, especially when we're dealing as we are today with two spaces at once. So we're in a virtual space together, but we're also all in a physical space, right? Um, so I want to just try something with you guys. Uh, if you will just take a moment um, to take a look around the physical space that you're in. Um, and this is something that we do like whenever I'm invited to you know, a lot of the time I get invited to like look at a location um, to try to have an idea for something that could happen there. And really the work is just to like exist in the space. And this is what I would like you guys to try now. Um, breathe. Take a look around at the space that you're in. Feel your body in the space, in the chair, whatever. Um, try to relax your jaw. Um, notice if your tongue is like stuck to the roof of your mouth, <laughs> if you like are able to relax your jaw, your throat, your breath, your spine, your pelvis, if you're sitting down or whatever. And then maybe start to think about like something that could happen in the space that you're in that would be unexpected like something that would constitute a surprise or like a magical disruption to the everyday use of that space. And this is something that feels really important to me just as like a life exercise, but also in experience making and in particular when we're talking about the intersection of technology and live art that we are often asking people to be in two places at once. So we're often asking them to experience a virtual space and a physical space. And sometimes we create the physical space and the virtual space. And sometimes we don't, right? Sometimes they're in their own home 
and our content constitutes a second space, but that audience member, that experiencer, that user, whoever it is, they still have a body. Their body is somewhere, you know? Um, and it really matters where like what, it really matters to them what is physically happening. Um, and so just that exercise of like, where am I, what's a, what's a expected use of this space and therefore what's like an unexpected use of this space is just something I wanted to share, like in the previous future spaces talks that I've watched, you know, there's been some creators that really like share their, their practice. And I just find it so generous to just like hear how people are making stuff. Um, so that's a, a large part of what I want to talk about today. And I wanted to share that with you guys. There's another exercise that we don't need to do, but I'll just leave it with you where you, um, this is from the Suzuki theater company in Japan, where you, you envision that the space that you're in is inside your body, um, which is just a really weird, trippy thing to do. And you guys should do it. <laughs> um, the second exercise I want to do before I get into like presenting is just, um, Something else that's very important to my practice, because like my background is really in 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 theater and like devised performance. Um, I I I that's what I studied. That's kind of where I came from is like theatrical practice. Um, and I also studied like critical theory and public art. So this really the in intersection of those those two things that you'll see in my work. But um, but something that's really important in theater and also in in life, as I'll talk about right now is um, what we have as a universal language for appreciation and um, and collective um, excitement. And, and that is applause. So I would like to just say a thank you to Josh for creating this series, for envisioning it and bringing it into the material world so that we can all share in it. And also to all of you guys for showing up. And I would like to just try a little experiment where you all unmute and give yourselves a round of applause. This is happening in real time. Let's see if it works. I hear Josh. <laughs> okay, cool. There's a lot of unmuted people. Are there I'm people? Them, it's so net. It's so interesting. This is like a real live Zoom experiment, you guys, to see if it will like offer I'm us. Seeing, I'm seeing clapping emojis. Amazing. Okay, cool. Yeah, this is. I mean, another thing I want to say about like virtual space and physical space is like we, you know, this is happening in real. This is real. This is happening live, guys. So like anything that we're trying, we're really gonna see if it if it works. And there's an, actually another exercise that I'll share with you guys from, from making um, live events with technology that I'm sure, which many of you do, um, which is that like at the start of our, uh, I also, because I said something about mysticism in my description that like on the opening night of anything that has a lot of tech in it, I always feel like it's really important to just like say a little prayer to like whatever the tech is. Like if you choose to intervene in our project tonight just we are asking that your decisions make the show better than we planned it to be um so i will just say that for anything uh that happens on this talk as well um but thank you guys for clapping the thing i want to say to you about clapping this i find so fascinating so like a lot of the time in creating a new work i'm looking for like some kind of universality some kind of universal language or like universal human experience at the core of like a theme or something that I'm working with and applause is one of the earliest documented universal languages and it occurs collectively it occurs spontaneously and when I say earliest I mean both like ancient in the ancient world but also in our early life so like we start clapping at about eight or nine months of age. If anyone has a little kid that's not clapping yet, it's not a problem. <laughs> Most people start clapping when they're eight or nine months old. And it's fundamental to our development and our ability to act and have agency in the world. Because what we're doing when we clap as babies is not only uh, finding a nonverbal language for declaring our existence sonically, showing appreciation, uh, communicating appreciation and excitement. But what we're also doing is physically finding our midline. 
So this is something that every day as grownups, we cross a midline every time you turn your head or like move your arm, you cross your midline constantly so much that you don't even think about it. But actually as infants, we establish our midline through practice uh, and, and experimentation. And it so many, I just want to read you guys some of these things that like the midline <laughs> depends on. Um, first of all, Attention, spatial orientation, coordination, memory, especially spatial memory, planning, especially motor planning, so anything that happens physically, increased confidence and reduced anxiety as a result of finding the mid the finding the midline is like what you guys just did in that exercise where you looked around the space. Any kind of grounding or centering exercise depends on understanding the existence of the midline. It's also the midline between the two sides of our brain right? The conceptual part and the uh, analytical part or whatever. Language development, reading, writing, all of these things depend on the midline. Um, and I also think it's a very exciting metaphor about what I was talking about earlier about holding audiences in virtual spaces and physical spaces at once, right? This idea of like crossing between to have, I'm just going to read you this quote and then we can move on from this nerd, nerd fest. The midline is a bridge between our two halves, our arms, legs, eyes, ears, nostrils, and the two hemispheres of the brain. Both sides of the body and mind are in constant dialogue with each other, converging at our midline, finding balance in our lives and centering ourselves in the midst of ongoing change relies on the midline. This is resilience. So like, it's so important. Um, and that is also what we're doing when we applaud, right? We're participating in a collective act of gratitude and appreciation in a universal nonverbal language, declaring our existence and like finding our center. Um, so cool thing about applause. What else do I, I'm like so excited about that that I get distracted and can't remember what I'm gonna say. Um, but I think the next thing I'm going to say is that I'm going to talk about some work. So uh, now I'm going to share my screen, which is the part that makes me freak out. So I want to talk about five uh, kind of essential principles of experience making. Um, the first of them is collectivity. So this is the idea that it matters that you came. Um, you guys are already experiencing that in this talk. Um, this is something that's really important to me in my work, that there's some feeling of the audience member that there, that there's a moment in the work where, um, there's some kind of sensation of interactivity or something that's, that declares like, it matters that you, that it matters that you in particular showed up at this particular time. Um, so that's something that we don't get when like, you know, we're watching Netflix or something, right? Like the medium itself doesn't uh, care <laughs> if we're there or not. Um, so that's something that I find to be like an essential uh, quality of liveness. What you're seeing in these images, just to talk a little bit about the work on the left, this is a um, headphone show I made for a, a band called In the Valley Below who wanted to do a, a immersive theater show for their album launch. So they, um, we used silent disco People walked through a house and saw like different rooms with different action that was all synced to the to their album. Um, and then on the left, this is a show called The Big Chase that I made for ASICS, um, where they wanted a bunch of running um, urban fitness influencers to take a run in downtown LA and have something really unexpected and wild happen to them. So I made this kind of detective noir show that happened um, in different locations that were five miles apart. Um, uh, with like 30 performers in eight different buildings and they all came together at the end in this abandoned cinema in downtown LA and all the people had to run to like complete the show. Um, so that's collectivity. Now it's wants to move my slides around as opposed to let me show them. Um, how about this mode? Does this work? Great. Oh my God. Okay, second principle I wanna talk about is synchronicity. So the idea that we are all together at the same time, pretty basic, right? But this is like, again, something I think that comes from theater, which is something I thought about a lot, especially during COVID, right? Like what makes something feel live? 
Um, and I realized that control of time, you show up at a specific time in a specific place and the artist has this incredible luxury of like control of space and time, right? So as we were talking about before, like um, right now we're together in time and we're together in virtual space, but we're not together in physical space. So I think this principle of synchronicity uh, is something that's just, yeah, very important to me. I see it as, a, as an essential quality of making something that feels live. Um, this image is from a recent work called Danger Season, um, which was a commission from a charity called Climate Power, who wanted to make these large scale kind of provocative uh, dioramas about extreme weather uh, right outside the Republican National Convention. So we did this um, two blocks from the RNC with, within the police cordon. We made these six um, sets that represented scene with actors in them that um, represented uh, scenes of, of real life extreme weather survival. Um, so what you see here is, is an actor who's inside a room that represents extreme heat and a, a person outside looking in. Um, and I'll talk a little, a little bit more about that project as we go on. Third principle of, of liveness, I think, is um, temporality. The idea that this will only happen once exactly as it's happening now. Um, even if, you know, you have the same show a thousand times on Broadway or whatever, it's it's um, it's unique for the people who who see it together in that moment. Um, this is a work called The Home. Uh, I made this for Domestic Violence Awareness Month uh, for the corporate social responsibility arm of Santander Bank. Um, they wanted to do a project about the financial implications of domestic violence. So um, I interviewed women who had escaped from violent partners and I created this interactive installation based on their stories where people walked from room to room and, and heard sound design based on what they had said. and. Um, and the light and sound changed as they moved through the house. Um, and I can talk about that work a little bit more as well. Um, spontaneity, how many have we done? Three, this is four. Um, spontaneity, the feeling that anything can happen. So this is also connected to this idea that it's temporal, it's happening live, <laughs> like my screen share. Um, anything can happen disastrous or delightful right like and there, there's a feeling in the in the space of like something um something unexpected could could happen um and the last one is about magic so this is the how did they do that moment right that's how I define magic is any any moment where people oh I'll say what this is sorry this is a sound walk um this is a sound walk called Kormos which we made in in Athens in Greece a couple of years ago um, it's in a, it was for a digital art exhibition for the Onassis Foundation, where all the works were about the body. Um, so I made a series of sound walks, um, for this public park about the body as a, both a, a simultaneously a, a very private space and a very public space, right? This is what we use to get around in the world. It's how people, it's what people see. Um, but also it's a house that no one will ever look out the window of, but us, um, so this was a trilogy of walks with uh, folks who had um, interviews with people who'd grown up near the park talking about um, themes of the body. Um, so magic. This is the how did they do that? Uh, this is a piece of work called Rest, which um, has a bunch of different multi-platform executions. But um, we made an experimental film of it during COVID um, up at MPAC in Troy, where we created these kind of sculpture is made of light um, uh, to explore how sensory experience informs how we how we create and perceive reality basically uh, the creation of reality as a participatory sensory act um, but in my work I'm always looking for these for the for for moments to be able to do something and I think in particular this relates to to the use of technology right whenever I'm using technology in a project, um, emerging tech or, you know, whatever that means, like using technology or using tools, it's often in service of like looking for that. How did they do that moment? Um, if I can elicit a, how did they do that in myself? Then I know that I'm kind of on the right track. So let's get into a little more detail about these projects. This is an image from the making of that film, just a light, just a light being, floating in space. Uh, you can find this if you guys want to look at it. It's on um, still on Free the Work, even though Free the Work is on hiatus. 
Uh, it was a short of the month on there. So here's a little bit more visual of like, I'm just going to talk about these two installations um, and a couple of sound walks, and then I'll have time for you guys to ask questions, which is the part that I'm the most excited about. Um, okay, so we had six windows to deal with <laughs> at the RNC. Um, the ask was to make something that showed extreme weather um, and also showed the relationship between Republican politicians and oil companies. Um, so I was looking for uh, images that would stop people in their tracks. Um, this is something that, you know, it, I love working in public space because you kind of have that principle of um, of the unexpected uh, just built in because people are not coming to something. They're just on their way to whatever and you, it's right in their way. Um, so something that I really like to play with in that space is making something look like it maybe should be there. And then when you look again, it shouldn't be there. Um, so I used these LED signs, um, very much inspired by Jenny Holzer, but also like to look at like, what's a, what's a medium that is like sanctioned with authority already, like something that looks like it could be a uh, shop sign it could be like a government thing could be a fruit it has all these connotations in our mind where like somebody put that there who who is allowed to put that there right and then we put content on it like project 2025 written by big oil etc cetera, etc cetera. um things that when people took a second look um uh they might realize that it's not what they thought it was and then i had um a room that was like a very realistic set of a, of a, a room that had been devastated by a flood and a room that was um, from a house that's suffering from extreme heat. So a lot of the research about extreme heat, um, oh, this is what it looked like before. So you can see like uh, we built those rooms completely. So like every wall, every set piece, every ceiling, like none of those are the, were there. <laughs> um, and like speaking of the principle of temporality, like that was there for for three days um, during the course of the of the RNC. Sorry, this is the extreme heat room. I don't know if you guys will be able to see if I zoom in. Maybe not. Um, oh my god. Uh, this is all based on research about the effects on plastics of extreme heat. So I was trying to think about like, who are the people who are very impacted by extreme heat, which is like the elderly and young people, and also um, all the research that I was doing about like what it does to stuff was about plastic. You just see all these images of like people's like garbage cans and tail lights and plastic cups and stuff in their car melting. And I was like, let's just translate that to inside. And what's the kind of room that has a lot of plastic in it? It's like a kid's playroom. So um, everything in this room is melting. Um, you can see some like melted crayon, the distress of like the wallpaper, the ceiling fan. There's like melted. And the actor in here is um, repairing an air conditioning unit. Um, this is a flood recovery space. Um, these actors rotated in and out of these rooms every 20 minutes. So I had... Um, uh, three different performers, different age groups, different demographics, skin colors, body types, et cetera. And what I was really trying to do there was like defeat any idea that people could look through that window and think like, oh, this is the kind of person that that happens to. So when you're looking at somebody repairing an air conditioner, if you come by one minute, you might see like an older white woman doing it. And you come by 10 minutes later and you see like a young Hispanic guy doing the same action. Um, this is an extension of that flood room. These are some guys looking <laughs> at my oil cabinets that are overflowing with oil. Um, so I had two very realistic rooms about extreme. It was very important to me that those were like hyper real, the flood room and the um, and the extreme heat room, and that they had living people in them. And then I had these in answer to the part of the brief that was about can you make images that are shocking and stop people in their tracks, but they're about closed door meetings between Republican politicians and oil companies. When you do the research for that, it's like the most boring visuals ever. It's like guys shaking hands. Um, so I actually put a sh hand sh shaking hand montage into the flood damage television in the flood room. But for the representation of those relationships, I made these like, um, these file ca filing cabinets that were overflowing with oil. 
this is in so you can see my guy shaking hands there on the screen um and then I made this room which was the kind of featured room in the corner which is a conference room with um guys with their heads buried in sand and on the television in that room there was a kind of powerpoint presentation about oil oil profits that would like glitch every few seconds into like wildfire footage and flood footage um so that is that project um this is again the home this is some shots of the interior of that space um so they were domestic spaces like you see on the top here and then they got increasingly weird um people had to go through this closet through like a kind of um laundry room that felt like a space that they shouldn't really be in and then into this kind of museum um gallery space which was really based on the parts of my interviews where women said they felt like they were living in a museum and they couldn't touch anything and they were under surveillance which the audience was under surveillance um the stage managers were watching them and cueing light and sound based on what they were doing and we made that very visible so like they could see the cameras um because it's just part of the dramaturgy and then these folks went through one at a time the last room was a waiting room um the waiting room was full of women um unexpectedly they would like been alone the entire time and then they opened a door and they found themselves in a waiting room full of women and those were actually the women that I interviewed for the project they asked I was just going to get actresses but they asked to be the people um, they wanted to like see the faces of the people coming through um, when they didn't know who they were. And uh, they just went straight through that waiting room. Somebody took their headphones and they went into a, um, I had four offices with social workers. So they had each audience member had a conversation with a, a social worker just in case um, they wanted to, because this took place in the Oculus. So I didn't want to just like kick them back out into the mall um so they there were four offices with social workers so the audience members could continue to cycle through some people spent five minutes some people spent an hour um talking to those folks and if they asked who were the women in the waiting room um the social worker would tell them but they didn't interact uh with the survivors this is the stage management booth where um we were controlling light and sound um sound and now sound walks um i'm gonna I'm going to move on very soon. I have more material than I can cover and I want to have time for your questions, but I guess I just, the most important thing I want to say about this. So this is research from current, which was a sound walk in lower Manhattan that was in the Tribeca festival in 2021. Um, the thing I want to say as it relates to my five principles in um, creating these walks is I was really looking for the inherent theatricality of the place and in Lower Manhattan, that was light. So based on that, I decided that these walks should take place at specific times of day. So current only happens after the sun goes over Lower Manhattan and you see these types of visuals as you're walking and the narrative includes that. Um, these are just visuals to show you guys how much damn research I do. <laughs> I read every book about Lower Manhattan. Um, no, it is it is important, I think, to talk in terms of talking about like my process of experience making. The beginning of the process is an extremely wide, it's like throwing the aperture as open as it possibly can get, right? Um, anything that feels like it could be part of something. And this is, I think, like what I want to touch on in closing as well. And almost like I was saying, um, I'm just going to like slam through these visuals because what I really want to say about like that wide aperture, this idea of like you have to see something in your mind, like that thing, whatever maybe you guys were imagining as like something that could um, exist in the space that you're in that would be surprising or magical or unexpected. This is all like sound walk visual. This is the latest one, which was in Austin and South by Southwest that had 20 performers that like synced with the audio. So it was about the eclipse and you would hear somebody be like, the convergence of the sun and the moon are doing this or whatever. And it's like whoosh. And then at the whoosh moment, you would see like all these people around you like hug each other at the same time. Um, and things like that kept kept happening. So that was a really um, joyful thing to make. This is how people access it. Uh, this is our cast. You kind of end up at the top of this hill. This is just like a nice um, film image. Okay, this is what I want to talk about to close. So you guys, just to go back to the clapping thing, 
You guys remember this person? Or maybe for the hook generation, you remember this person? So in the stage version of Peter Pan, Tinkerbell is just represented by a fragment of light and like a little tinkling bell. And the idea is that only Peter Pan can see or understand her, right? And that's the most important thing I wanted to say today is like, I just feel like we have to take that time to envision the unexpected thing that only we can see and believe in it as much as if it actually existed and see it as our responsibility to, as I was saying about what Josh has done with this series, like manifest the thing that only we can see in physical space so that other people can see it, which is like sewing your shadow onto the physical world, you know? And so I want to try the clapping thing again, because this is what happens in Peter Pan, right? Like there's a, and it's again about the idea of um, it matters that you're here. At this moment in the stage version, it's like Tinkerbell is dying or something. <laughs> and Peter Pan like turns to the audience and is like, she's so, it's so, you know, the idea or whatever, the vision is like so faint that I can barely make it out. But I think she's saying that she could live if you believed. And then he says, if you believe, clap your hands. Yay. Thanks, you guys. All right. Hey, thank you so much. This is thank great. Thank you. All right. So there's a lot, there's a lot of places where we could talk here. Um, and also um put your questions in the chat. I will, I will uh I will cue them up. So I, you know, there there's a few things I was kind of curious about. So like one, I was wondering for like the Oculus project, what um like what did the team look like that put that together? Because I would imagine it's like a sort yeah. of disciplinary team and like what is your you know yeah how do you how do you interact with that with that team to sort of shape that vision thank you for asking that question um so the core team were the production designer uh who designed the house the sound designer and the lighting designer uh followed very shortly by the stage manager who figured out how to cue it so that's really like in addition obviously to the production company, all the producers, the structural engineer, the build crew, the enormous art department that like put that thing together. Um, that is sort of like the core creative team. Um, so I worked with the production designer to come up with, the, I mean, I really had like the, the, the conceptual vision for each of those rooms, you know, like I was like, I think it's like, I want to make sure that the exterior looks like you know, because the, the brief was like, make it look like a normal house. And I was like, super problematic idea. What's a normal house? <laughs> so it's a normal house. And also again, sort of like I was saying about danger season, like we want to issue, is that the right idea? Like cur curb the idea that like, uh, I know that the audience is going to think like, oh, you're, you're, we, we try to distance ourselves from these things as much as possible. Right. So anything that we can pick out, like I don't wear that kind of sweater, so I'm never going to be in an abusive relationship. Anything yeah. we can find is like going to distance ourselves. And so I wanted the exterior to look like it came out of a 3d printer. And then I wanted every room to be like interior room, be like a very specific American house. Um, uh, from the beginning until the sort of like surrealist parts that were more metaphorical. So yeah, I worked, I worked with a production designer to envision those, those rooms. Um, and then, and so she was on, in the, on the team from the very beginning. Um, uh, and that's, her name is Nina Kausa. She's an incredible production designer, um, theater, film, video game. She also designed uh, a video game for Sam Barlow, who you, maybe he's here. <laughs> Um, uh, the sound designer, Jackie Zoe, also an incredible, um, director in her own right. Um, I did the interviews and I edited them and Jackie and I put them together 
Um, so you didn't just hear like stories, like podcast style, the voices were also used to um, track the trajectory of what it felt like to go through those experiences. So at some points, the voices were like so overlapped and cacophonous and overwhelming that you couldn't make out what was being said, like when you were getting compressed into this like little laundry room, for example. Um, so I was doing a lot of audio editing in terms of like the script and Jackie was doing all the spatialization and sound design and collaborating with me on that. And then Andrew Schneider, who I also, um, make the sound walks with, he's a, a, a frequent collaborator and we have a sound walk making company now called point a, um, but we also work together in a bunch of different capacities. He did the interactive lighting design, um, um for that, for that project. And then, um, uh, and then, yeah, the, st the stage management team put together like the 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 way that they would use like CCTV and um, and a yeah, lighting. It's, it, it's so fascinating to me because like I, you know, we do a lot of like interactives and museums and things like that. And the idea of having yeah. a stage manager, you know, something that like yeah. controls the physical space, like that's just not a vocabulary that they have in those spaces. Totally. Yeah. Um, totally. And it's just, but but I guess I, it makes sense because the point of departure is more theatrical in some ways. Um, Naf had a question. I want to. Naf, do you want to come on camera and ask that question yourself? Otherwise, I can totally. Ask um, I'm going to try. Uh, there you go. Just okay. a moment. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for this, uh, Annie. Uh, because I'm researching uh, liveness and you know the shifting of meaning of liveness, whether oh, cool. anything is live at all, uh, yeah. if it is oh, all cool. mediatized. So all these, you know, questions, meta questions. So <laughs> I was wondering. Uh, how have you arrived at these five principles? Because uh, there are a couple of authors who are also, who have kind of pointed out uh, different meanings of life, but it's interesting mm -hmm. uh, on the temporality aspect of things, uh, how you kind of dissected it from, uh, from the spontaneity. So it, the, you've kind of dissected them, which was pretty cool. Uh, but how do you see this evolving with uh, things like the ABBA voyage or you know, Cirque du Soleil mm -hmm. kind of performing for Cosm kind of a thing or kinetic mm -hmm. performances. So just these new forms of performances. So how will uh, that affect your five principles or <laughs> the other way around? Yeah, I thank you for that question. I mean, yeah. I think in a, the short answer is like, I'm excited to see how those things evolve, you know, like how, like, how um if it continues to be important for things to feel live is one big question right because these are things that i came up with because you know really i came up with them in response to like a co a covid conversation where people i felt like a lot of people were being like there will always be liveness because since the dawn of time man has gathered around the campfire to whatever and i was like i really felt like guys we're going to have to do better than that there's going to have to be a better argument for like funding things that happen in real space and time so i like thought that you know like sat down to think about it um but it was really based on like here are if it is important for something to feel live, here are ways to make it feel live. So I think in answer to your question, if it continues to feel important for things to feel live, then I hope that this can be, as you say, among the tools um, for people trying to do that. Um, and, and yeah, I think, I think that's the answer. Does that answer your question? I, I could go down the rabbit hole. I mean, I, I think actually even even this future spaces stuff, um, you know, the fact that it ha is is synchronous and and temporal is right. like yeah. there 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 there's a sense of like oh this is an event. Whereas if I you and I just had this conversation and put it out on like a like a podcast or whatever, um, mm. which I thought about doing because I'd probably get more um, views. But like it, but it would you know it would be more convenient for people. But there'd be there wouldn't be a sense of like actually gathering, you know. And I and I think totally. the gathering part also creates the sense of community it's like okay we were all here at the same time we're all doing this thing you know mm -hmm. like yeah yeah and we're, like you know we're all doing two things like we're yeah. doing this and we're also where we are right and so like totally. i but i definitely think i mean that's like kind of what i, I had never before before covid i never had to think about that like why yeah. is 
theater, theater or whatever, like what? And I had been thinking for years prior, like how to make, uh, how to make performance into more of a place than an event, right? That has always been like a massive it, it interest of mine is like, how yeah. can this, how can this experience be a place that you went and something happened to you, something that happened to you as opposed to something that you watched, right? I have very yeah. little interest in making something for people to watch well, it's it's so funny because it's like i i saw hamilton on broadway like way back in the day and over overpaid for the tickets you know to see the original cast and then they have it on like disney plus but it's like are, have you but like it's i think there's a different part there's like a different way that you could even assume that as part of your identity you know what i mean like yeah. i saw hamilton versus like i watched it on disney plus like it's it's a it's a different thing i'm gonna ask i'm gonna let someone else uh ask a question because I just put a link because somebody asked, have I published them? I did. Oh, write, yeah, nice. I wrote this essay. Um, I wrote this essay in 2020 where I talk about them. Oh, I love it. I'm going to. All right. Awesome. Uh, Nikolai had a question. Hey, Annie. Uh, sorry. One second. Hi. Technology. Hey, uh, thanks for the talk. And I, I really uh, I love the work and I, I really appreciate your energy and, and just your, your humor as you kind of. Uh, navigated the te technological glitches but um i would love to hear more about sort of what your own personal trajectory was that led you to doing this kind of work sure i'll try to say that shortly <laughs> in a short way um so i uh, i mean i was like a theater kid i grew up in san francisco and in the years that i was growing up like formative companies that i saw as a child were like the sf mime troupe um, who were like an experimental political theater company. They would just like do shows in public about like what was happening in the moment. And like, you know, people would just be sitting around and and, the, and it was very like, you know, um, put up a sheet and put on a show kind of like school of theater. It was very DIY, very like use what you have devised work um, about like the issues of the day. And then there was another really important company um, in my childhood called the Pickle Family Circus, um, who were uh, Bill Irwin, who's like a very famous actor now, um, uh, but is he's an experimental clown. And Bill Irwin and a couple of other clowns made this company called the Pickle Family Circus, and they only toured in Northern California. Um, and they did like corporeal mime and um, yeah, experimental clown shows again, like anywhere in the in the street in like a town hall. So as a child, I really came up with like the idea that there really was no difference between like theater and like happenings. So that kind of thing about like spontaneity, collectivity, the unexpected was like really ingrained, um, but also like physical performance and making it up and using what you have and just like doing it yourself um, was very ingrained in me. And then uh, when I was like 18, um, I met Eve Ensler, who wrote the Vagina Monologues, and she was doing a thing where she was giving away the rights to her work for anyone who wanted to do their own production of anything she had written to um, raise money for charities that work to end violence against women. Um, and so from Eve, I really, and she like kind of raised me as an artist, to be honest, like about just like being the, the idea of like, to be an artist is also to be like a community organizer and a uh, you know, impassioned like voice for what you feel is important and the kind of like, and, and also she just really taught me that like, you can do it. You don't have to, you know, like you would need a set, make it whatever you need a space, like find one, talk to them until they give it to you, you know? Um, mm -hmm. so those were like a couple of very formative experiences. And then I guess, lastly, I'll say that I, I studied, I moved to the UK um, to study literature and philosophy. And I, I went to Goldsmiths, which is like a kind of experimental art school to do that. Um, so I ended up studying a lot of like public art and installation art and critical theory. And I also um, kind of got into a community very early on of like people who were making site-specific theater, like uh, Shunt was a very important company to me who are now David Rosenberg um it now runs Darkfield who make like blackout um, shipping container shows but he used to have a theater company called Shunt that made like weird performance um and site specific they had like a venue in these abandoned railway tunnels under London Bridge where they would do like shows and parties and stuff 
um punch drunk like early kind of been involved like with those guys from the early 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 shows um another company called dream think speak who were doing site-specific work and so then i moved to la and and i saw all these abandoned buildings and i was like great i'm gonna get in there Very that's as short, well, that's as, short as i could do that was well done <laughs> thank you really cool stuff all right so we're, we're almost i want to i want to ask one question though um what, what do you think, you know, it's so interesting because a lot of the work that you're showing, it's like, it's, it's, it, it is more like theater scale. It's not like, mm -hmm. it, it has to embrace like massive scale in terms of like audiences. Like, I think there's a lot of people also, you know, think about these things of like, okay, it needs to be these really scalable things. And I, and yeah. I'm always kind of like thinking about this, like the trade-off between intimacy and scale. So uh, such a cool idea. Yes. Ask your question. But that's, that not, I don't, that's not even a question. I mean, how do you think about the trade-off between intimacy and scale? I will you tell you what I think, Josh. Yes. I want to make things that have a mass reach. I'm interested in mass communication. And I do have, I actually have a project that I really want to tell you guys about, which is a little bit of a non sequitur. So I'm just going to like put it in the chat. Um, this is a project called Up in Arms, which is a social practice project uh, that I made with my friend Anna Maria Nabier, where we photograph black women and white women who are friends and talk to them about their friendship. We've been doing that for eight years. It's based on our own friendship. We recreated this famous photo of Gloria Steinem and Dorothy Pittman Hughes, uh, where they have their fists raised. And we've, ma we've made recreations of that photo with all these different pairs of women around the world. This is a link to an archival exhibition that we did, like a big retrospective of the work that we did last year. But the reason that it relates to your question and that I wanted to make sure to talk to you guys about it is, first of all, we're looking for exhibition opportunities for it in the U.S., which I wanted to make sure to say in this forum. And also we're doing a book. So Morcos Key, who designed our exhibition, and they also designed the Black Futures show at, at the Brooklyn Museum and the As Devlin show that just ended at Cooper Hewitt. They're designing this book that's like a part art book, part handbook about intersectional collaboration and like working uh, in an interracial context. Um, so that's gonna that, that's in process now and it's gonna come out next year. And I really see that as a mass communication object. Love it. Like that's why we're doing a book is like so that a project that the core of it is just me and Anna and two other women that's like the when we see the pairs we just it's the four of us in the room but we wanted to make sure that ultimately there would be an artifact that would have a mass communication reach that would like come from the artwork so that we could share but the last thing i want to say about intimacy versus scale was that what you said yeah yeah so for me and i'm and I make this argument a lot because I work with brands and people talk about like, why should we spend our money on making an experiential thing rather than like a TV spot? And what I say is like, you can make a TV spot and you can like lightly brush <laughs> 60 million people or whatever, right? Like there's probably all of us can count on one hand the TV ads that are like stuck in our brain from life, right? Like the like, the like, jingles or whatever but if you put someone through a personal experience with their body in space and time that moves them mm -hmm. and the way that you move them is with all that recent million books that i showed you you know like that you have like depth to what you are showing them if you put them through a personal embodied experience you have them for life so that. you don't have 60 million people. You maybe have 600 people, but they will never forget that that happened to them, you know? Yeah. And yeah. that is that to me, like, that's my dharma. Like, that's my like yeah. role, you know, on this earth. Like I'm that I'm good at that, you know? Yeah. Um. And so mass communication is important to me, but I, I'm, I'm in my lane, you know, <laughs> intimacy. I love it. I love it. Intimacy I love is it. my well, lane. That's, well, that's fantastic. Well, Annie, thanks so much for being here today. This was a super, super interesting presentation. I love the conversation. I mean, I could keep going. Um, but, you know, you, you, you talked about this new project, but is there anything else you sort of like want to kind of put out there to the community, uh, you know, re release into the world? I mean, that's that really like, 
that is my at the at this precise moment I have I have multiple projects in development but what I what I really wanted to make sure about like upcoming work to say was um was that we're working on this book for up in arms and that we're looking to tour the exhibition and particularly in the US um and I just wanted to say that to you guys and I'm just going to put my email in the chat cuz if and I'll share I'll share different. all these links also in an email to to everybody who attended stuff like that yeah um, you, but yeah, this is this is fantastic. Annie. Thanks, thanks so much for joining. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Josh. It's really nice to see you. And thanks, sir, everyone for listening. Yeah, and uh, thanks everyone for joining. I was going to say I'm going to be gone the next two weeks. I'm going to be in New York, and then I'm going to Copenhagen. So if anyone has restaurant recommendations in Copenhagen, I'll I'll be in weird time zones. Uh, but then I'll be coming back. We got a whole bunch of uh, new talks coming up. Some really exciting stuff. So I hope you guys can join me um, again. Annie, thanks so much. Thanks everybody for joining. We'll uh, we'll circle back soon. Bye. Bye.